say in order to get started, I will, uh, I'll just speak and introduce the panel, and then as each one comes up to take their turn, I'll just load your PowerPoint while you start talking, just to kind of save time to get us started. So again, everybody, thank you. Welcome to the symposium. My name is Brent Bolin. I'm the Director of Public Affairs of the Anacostia Watershed Society. So we are right now, whether you know it or not, in the Anacostia River watershed. The Paint Branch right out here at the front of campus is a major tributary of the Northeast Branch. Um, the Northwest Branch starts up in Montgomery County. Northeast Branch starts up in Prince George's County. And they meet at Bladensburg, Maryland to form the Anacostia River proper. So I'll get into the geography a little bit more in a minute. Um, but just real quick, our panelists are going to be Lisa Pelstring from the Department of Interior, uh, Lauren Poor, a colleague from Blue Water Baltimore, sort of our equivalent organization up there, uh, Jorge Bugantes, who's a conservation re natural resource specialist on our staff, and uh, Dennis Chestnut from Groundwork Center Castle River, D.C. So, uh, you know, our basic goal as an organization is a swimmable and fishable Anacostia River. Most people have heard that. That sort of comes from the Clean Water Act. Um, and we have education teams, restoration, what Jorge does, recreation, and advocacy. So here's a map of the Anacostia River. So we're somewhere over here. There's Lake Artemisia, so we're over here-ish. Um, so you can see that the river starts way up uh, in Montgomery County, the Northwest Branch, up around Sandy Spring. So, and it ends down here, it flows out and joins the Potomac just to the south of the monumental core of the district through Ward 7 and 8. Um, and these are some of the most challenged zip codes in the area. Whereas, you know, if you've been driving around up around Sandy Spring, uh, horse farms, sort of a very different area. So there's certainly a geographic overlay for the environmental justice context of our watershed. Uh, but there's a lot more to it than that, and that's what we're going to try to bring out today with the panel. So the interesting thing is, is if you really look at this, you can see that 80% of the watershed, which is the feeder streams that feed into the main stem of the Anacostia, are actually in Maryland. But if you look at the main stem of the river, seven of the eight miles are in the district. So we have a perception of this is a district river, this is a district problem. Not really. Prince George's County is 50% of the watershed. So what happens here is really important for outcomes uh, downstream in the district. So that's something that's interesting too, is having this interjurisdictional context, DC, Maryland, uh, and then the counties, which as you know, under Maryland state government are pretty powerful. Uh, where I come from, the counties don't really mean anything at all. So that's always interesting. Uh, so again, just a little bit about more about the watershed. So our biggest problem, uh, we're talking about the eastern half of DC and the Maryland suburbs of DC. So it's a highly developed area. 75% of the land area in the watershed is built out. Um, and with all the land from the National Park Service is a big chunk of the 25%, and then the Beltsville Agricultural Research Center is a big chunk. So it's really developed. Uh, most of these areas are older, so they were built before modern stormwater management. And so all that means is when it rains in a forest, water lands, soaks into the ground, recharges groundwater. But when it rains on a parking lot, it hits that hard surface and runs off. And whatever's in that parking lot runs off with the water. So oil, dirt, bottles, chip bags, please don't litter. So all those things end up in the river. So really our major problem is urban stormwater. And actually, if you look at the entire Chesapeake Bay, the only source of pollution to the bay that's still increasing is urban stormwater runoff. So we know better now, and in modern development practices, we try to control that through green infrastructure measures like green roofs and rain gardens and things like that. Um, but I think we're doing that now. We need to do even more of it than we are. Um, so that's something that we've been pushing towards. But other major things in our river, trash. Uh, we have a sewage problem. In the district, in the older part of the district, there's a combined sewer zone where the storm sewers and sanitary sewers are one system. So when it rains, to prevent those pipes uh, from backing up into people's basements, there's actually discharge valves that flip and discharge the combined raw sewage directly into the Anacostia River to the tune of billions of gallons a year. Now this problem is going to be fixed under a consent decree with DC Water, uh, who operates the Blue Plains Wastewater Treatment Plant. 
they have started construction on a tunnel uh, that's going to run from RFK Stadium to Blue Plains Wastewater Treatment Plant at the southern tip of the district, about eight miles. It's 100 feet under the river, as big as a metro subway tunnel, okay? And all of that is so that overflow will go into that tunnel and be stored and pumped out uh, in dry weather to go through the treatment train, which is a good thing, but it's a huge, huge project that's gonna be really expensive to do. So, but that's underway. And now up here in Maryland, we have a different problem. All our sewer lines here, all our sewage goes to Blue Plains. It's the largest wastewater treatment plant in at least this hemisphere of the world. So it's a huge plant. And our lines are all, all the sewer lines are gravity fed, so that means they were laid through Stream Valley Parks. So if you're somebody who goes to our Stream Valley Parks, you've probably seen sewer stacks sti sticking up out of creeks or pipes going across the creeks. Well, the bad news is, is those were all buried uh, five, six, eight feet underground when they were laid. And over time, because of all this stormwater runoff has promoted too high of flows in our tributaries, it's caused an incredible amount of erosion in our upstream tributaries in Maryland, exposing these pipes. And these terracotta pipes were never meant to bear their own weight or to be exposed to the elements. So when they are revealed through erosion, they break, and then you have sanitary sewage discharges that way. So the interesting thing is, is our water quality specialist tests for bacteria and the Maryland segment of the Anacostia at Bladensburg actually tends to have higher bacteria levels than down in DC in the combined sewer zone. Now part of that is the amount of water and more of the Potomac is flushing back up the lower Anacostia as part of the daily tide. But even at Bladensburg, there's a three foot tide every day. So it just tells you the extent of that problem. Uh, in fact, right now over at uh, Prince George's Community College, they're having a hearing on county bills for the General Assembly next year, a lot of them brought WSSC. If you live in Montgomery, Prince George's County, please always be in favor of your rate increases because that's what's gonna replace that decades old infrastructure. Um, most sewer pipes have a 50 to 60 year life. Most of the WSSC pipes have been in the ground 80 or more. So uh, they're also under a consent decree to replace those pipes. Uh, but it takes a lot of time because you gotta dig, Etc. Uh, and then one source that we're going to unpack a lot today is toxics in the Anacostia River. Some of that comes from fossil fuels, uh, so like all the roadway runoff carries petroleum products, PAHs. But if we go back to the map, we have a number of legacy industrial sites along the river. The Washington Navy Yard, uh, that's Washington, D.C.'s only Superfund site. Uh, that was one of the biggest industrial plants in the world for the better part of 100 years. Um, they cleaned that site up. Uh, Poplar Point also has in uh, Anacostia Park, has a long history of federal land uses there. There's a big section of the park you kind of can't get to, and that's because there's all these old greenhouses and old buildings there where there were industrial uses by the feds. Uh, then Washington Gas had a coal gasification plant right on the lower river, right in the heart of Boathouse Row, where there's a lot of recreational use by growers and boaters. Um, we've litigated to get that cleaned up. Uh, one site that we've worked on quite a bit is the Pepco Bedding Road power plant, coal-fired power plant, been there for over 100 years. Um, the last 20, 25 years, they've been burning fuel oil instead of coal, but I think you know Dennis can tell you a little bit when he speaks about uh, what that plant has been like with the surrounding communities over the years. So because the Anacostia is very slow flowing, uh, it has a lot of sedimentation from all this erosion, and then all that pollution we've been talking about, a lot of the PCBs and PAHs tend to bind to the sediments and end up, uh, so a lot of sediment in the river, a lot of pollution that binds to sediments. So there's sediment hotspots throughout the bottom of the river. And one of the issues that I really want to talk about today is a new study that just came out examining subsistence fishing on the Anacostia, where people are fishing for catfish to eat, and catfish, of course, are bottom feeders. So they're hanging out in the worst place in the river. In some ways, they're the worst things to catch. So, uh, and this is just an example of, you know, this is your average sort of suburban development, but look at the amount of green versus the amount of gray. Uh, and that's all places where there's stormwater runoff. So you can see this is what the upstream tributaries look like throughout the Anacostia watershed. Here's an example of sediment pollution where two creeks come together. It's pretty stark. Um, and you can see again here in Slyco Creek um, where that sewer stack is exposed on the upper left there. That's not supposed to look like that. 
But down here in a, high, in a hard rain, you can see why. Because you have that high level of flow, that high level of flashiness, which just acts, it's like putting a fire hose in a sandbox during these hard rains. All the flow that comes down through the storm sewer discharge pipes. So the other thing I wanted to show you is just up the road from where we are today, the Jiffy Loop, up on uh, Baltimore Avenue, this Jiffy Loop lost 50 feet of its parking lot, and the problem was caused, started by erosion caused by uh, the paint branch flashiness. It, it, it hit sort of a critical point, and more and more of it started falling in. Then it cracked a WSSC pipe, which caused flow, and it just had this accelerating snowball effect until this guy lost 50 feet of his land, almost up to his building. And he had to spend over a million dollars putting a bulkhead into the river and backfilling to fix that problem. So the thing I always say is, even if you're not a tree hugger and you don't care about fish or bunnies or birds or whatever, like this costs people money. Poor development practices upstream of this business owner cost this business owner a million dollars. And so that's sort of the business case I try to make to public officials is there's a real cost here, you know, this isn't just like an, oh, the snail darter went extinct, who cares? It's like, this is real money for real people, real economy in an urban area. And this is a good example of, if you know where Prince George's Plaza is, just to the west of Prince George's Plaza, they built these new apartment buildings right across the street from Home Depot. Before they could build those um, apartments, they had to remediate this problem. Prince George's Plaza was built out with no stormwater controls. So for 30 plus years, it rained on that. The water's gotta go someplace. It finds the lowest point to run off. So it made its way to the Northwest Branch from the Prince George's Plaza parking lot and dug this gully. Rufus there is about six feet tall. So you can see that's over 20 feet deep, that gully that was dug. And again, for the people that built that apartment building to develop that building, they had to intercept the water that was coming to their property from the mall, treat it, pump it, like, can, like grab the water, send it around, and then replace all the land that had been lost. It's just crazy. So I don't, I could go on and on, but I'm not going to. Um, the last thing I just wanted to show you is uh, this brown bullhead catfish. So U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has shown that 60% of the brown bullhead catfish in the Anacostia have cancerous tumors or lesions as a result of all this pollution. And when you hear about the level of subsistence fishing that's going on in the river, uh, you'll see that this is a really big issue. But uh, Dennis, if it's okay, I'd like to start with you. Sure. Is that all right? So everybody, Dennis Chestnut's gonna come up. Uh, he'll probably tell you this about himself, but he's a lifelong resident of the Anacostia watershed and uh, has been uh, running groundworks. How long have you guys been around now? Three years, but he's been around a lot longer than that. Is an important uh, voice and actress in the watershed. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just put the map back up. Uh, the zip codes uh, in uh, 
2019 uh, through the uh, zip codes that are in Ward 8, that are the uh, 2020, 2018, those zip codes, are among what is known as some of the most challenged zip codes in Washington, D.C. So, um, and, and it's very instrumental that uh, Brent mentioned, 85% uh, of the watershed, is, the Anacostia watershed is in Montgomery, Prince George's County, but everybody knows that things flow down. And uh, the main stem of the Anacostia River uh, is coming right through Washington, D.C. So whatever uh, happens uh, upstream impacts us downstream. So if nothing else ties us all at the hip, so to speak, it's the water. Uh, we are connected by way of the water more so than anything else. Uh, I wanted to just uh, point out uh, some, some things about the, uh, the area, and then we'll have a chance to ask some questions uh, a little later. Uh, um, the Washington, D.C. is a city of neighborhoods and communities. So uh, I'm going to speak on, just, just mention these neighborhoods and communities and, and uh, bring to your attention River Terrace, Parkside, Kenilworth, Eastland Garden. Uh, those are the uh, neighborhoods and, and communities on the eastern side of the city that actually border the Anacostia River. They're right on the edge of the Anacostia River. Um, Hillbrook, Deanwood, Benning Heights, Marshall Heights, um, Lincoln Heights. Uh, I'll refer to these neighborhoods and communities, uh, uh, Hillcrest even, even though that's Pope Branch for the most part, are, are, are Watts Branch Stream Valley neighborhoods. They are um, uh, neighborhoods that are in the Watts Branch sub-watershed uh, of the Anacostia. Watts Branch is the largest tributary in the, the um, in D.C. that feeds the Anacostia River. Uh, just to bring to your attention some of those neighborhoods, because they've all been impacted by whatever has taken place as it relates to the Anacostia River and the eastern side of the city. Uh, to point out a few of those which Brent did earlier, of course, uh, one that he left off that I'd like to mention, and that is the city's landfill, Kenilworth. It's now called Kenilworth Park, but um, you know, for decades, uh, up until uh, the early 70s, that was Washington, D.C.'s landfill, located um, in Ward 7, uh, right along the banks of the Anacostia River, just north of the Pepco Power Plant which also, the Pepco site also is a uh, site of, uh, of the incinerator, uh, where the uh, uh, Department of Public Works and the Department of Sanitation uh, burned its trash. After open burning uh, of trash and debris uh, used to take place actually on that uh, uh, landfill site before it was closed. Um, also, I'd like to uh, point out to you a couple of other demographics uh, before my time uh, is, is actually up. Um, the, um, the community is very interesting. It is made up of, of, of poor, uh, working class, and middle class. It's a very diverse and mixed income uh, area. So um, there are a lot of, of challenging situations and disparities east of the river. But I just want to point out to you that even though there's uh, in certain parts as high as a 28% unemployment rate, uh, also it houses, uh, I mean, it, it, it has uh, a very middle class of uh, areas of the community as well. As a matter of fact, one of the things that we used to tell these kids was uh, the first millionaire east of the Anacostia River was right in the Deanwood neighborhood, a gentleman by the names of uh, Mr. Cummings ran a trucking company uh, where he owned several dump trucks and when uh, a lot of the uh, construction contracts began, he got on top of that and, and wound up becoming a millionaire, you know? It was really fantastic because I went to uh, uh, junior high school with his sons, you know, and that changed their lives completely, not all of us. Uh, and also I'd like to point out uh, something about that CSO, that combined sewer overflow, because as Frank discussed with you, um, those stream crossings that Brent discussed, well, 
in the older part of the city, that combined sewer overflow is, is, is where that took place, you know, up in the, where all in the older city. Out in uh, uh, east of the river in Ward 7 and 8, it was a mixed bag of things. That area of the city was the area that actually at one point was referred to as Washington County. It wasn't even on street maps at one point. Uh, when I was in high school, um, I went to high school in Northwest at Coolidge High School up near Tacoma Park. And uh, my classmates, uh, when there was a party or something happening out in my neighborhood, didn't know how to find their way out of it. They, they swore I lived in Maryland. But uh, uh, that area of the city was known as Washington County, and so therefore some of the development followed very late. And that was even development as it related to sewer lines. So uh, wherein um, a lot of those sewer lines were also, um, a lot of those sewer lines were also, so I'm, this is my timer, let me know that my time is almost up. Uh, a, lot of my, uh, a lot of those sewer lines were also exposed. Uh, before Groundwork became an actual organization, uh, one of my tasks used to be walking Watts Branch, identifying where the uh, sewer line crossings were, because one of the things that I discovered one Saturday morning in taking my uh, Watts Branch screen walk was, uh, uh, and as a matter of fact, it was on a Martin Luther King holiday. Uh, a sewer line was broken, and there was raw sewage dumping into Watts Branch, uh, and at the point that I contacted DPW, it was a holiday, and I don't know how long it had been dumping, but this was dumping into Watts Branch, right in the area of uh, Nanny Hollow Burroughs Avenue, and uh, on its way to the Anacostia River. But these older communities uh, were, were beneficial in some ways because the late development that came kept, uh, gave the communities time to really focus on some things. But at the same time, um, you know, we're catching what the old development, you know, dropped on us. So it's, it's that kind of thing. And then lastly, I'd like to talk about the most important thing that we do, and that is um, we engage work and engage with the local community. Because these communities are so challenged in so many ways, uh, one of the first things that we've learned that uh, is the most important is to go in and listen listen to the community, find out what the challenges, problems, concerns are from the local community. Uh, and what that does is that, that really winds up uh, helping us a lot as well. Uh, secondly, we begin our engagement with those local communities in that way, uh, uh, becoming familiar, uh, putting a face there, understand, letting them understand that we care about what they care about and are willing to work with them around those things. And then we begin to be able to inform and introduce the community to the other kinds of things that are relative to their challenges, to their concerns. Because it's all it's all connected. I mean, you know, I, I you know it, I don't like the silo stuff, you know. I mean the thing about it is it's all interconnected. Somebody I went to a forum once and I'm gonna end on this. Uh, uh, I'll just say that the last thing we try to do is empower that community to become stewards of their own community. So that that empowerment enables the community members to uh, take control and take charge of uh, what it back. Don't wait for the, the government, don't wait for groundwork, don't wait for Take charge of, of it and empower themselves. That's our goal, to empower them so that over the long term, whatever is done is sustainable. And I, I was going to say, I went to a forum, I was on a forum, a panel, and I was on there with, with a lot of political folks. You know, I don't know why I was there. but. Uh, they went around the audience and they asked the audience to write down, uh, they, had, they gave them a list of things and the things that they wanted to check off that they wanted to most hear about. And of course education was on there and some other things and, and environment was on there. One person in the whole audience checked environment. So I said, well, I might as well get up and leave, you know. She said, no, 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 you want to hear it. But environment was down at the bottom of the list. And, and, I, and when I did get a chance to speak, you know, I simply said, look, this overarches and envelops everything. It envelops the education. It envelops the e economy. It envelops it all. So when, you know, that term environment, green, a lot of times I don't use it, but at the same time, look at it as an overarching, um, totally enveloping kind of, of uh, thing that it, it covers everything. It's totally encompassing. 
So with that, I'll uh, take my seat and and uh, look forward to answering some questions when uh, that time comes. Thank you. All right, so up ne uh, Jorge will be up next, so I'll uh, real quick start setting up. I'm working with the DC Office of Planning to make the 11th Street Bridge Park. Errol Mazursky, the Environmental Leadership Program. Vicki Chan, the University of Maryland. Uh, Matthew Bonhendi, Green Hair and Information Services. Olivia Walker, Home Services, University of the Health Sciences. But uh, I also have an organization called Church Community Health Links. And I'm a native Washingtonian whose family has been living in Ward 7 for 60 years. I grew up there. So I can tell you some things. <laughs> Great, thanks. That was a better use of time than dancing, so I'm going to So, uh, Jorge's going to talk a little bit about uh, Latinos and whatever. All right, yeah. my name is Jorge Valdez. I'm the Natural Resources Specialist of the Natural Watershed Society. I'm originally from Costa Rica. some experience working with uh, people from rural communities, indigenous people, although my focus has always been you know, restoration and biology side of things, uh, just stop, you know, engaging with communities has always been used to me. So, this is a great picture from Jake Parra, the photographer. Uh, this is a panel of aquatic gardens. So, you know, like Fran mentioned, this is the Yannick Coastal Watershed, mostly 85% of the South Maryland side. Alright, so first of all, uh, let's go with some terms. So what's Hispanic? Uh, the, you know, the US government uses a lot of the, the term, and in general, they use it a lot here in, in the US. So, you know, it originally came from the Latin Hispanus, uh, Hispania, that's to the, what today is Spain and Portugal. So that was under the Roman rule, that was uh, Hispania. And then it, it came to be called Spain. And then, so it means people from Spain and or Portugal or just a Spanish speaker it could be from Europe or Latin America. That's why it's widely used by the government. <clears throat> then Latino. Uh, some people say that uh, it's incorrectly used as a synonym, synonym for Hispanic. So Latino uh, means someone from Latin America, someone with Latin origin or ancestry. And you know, you have Latino or Latina because in Spanish there's genders for the nouns, so Latina male, Latina female. Uh, yeah. My wife usually says that it's a sexist language. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, this is the map of Latin America, most Spanish, Portuguese speaking countries. Uh, and there's also a Latin Europe population, uh, Prince George's County, 50%, and District of Columbia, 9.5%. And the, the, the total population for the DC metro area is 
so, you know, uh, this is a major urban area in the U.S. Uh, and there's a lot of immigrants, so you know, there's also there's a lot of, you know, on the rise of the immigrant population that we can see in this map. <clears throat> and that poses some challenges with the environment, the outreach and environmental uh, work. Uh, the countries of origin here for the D.C. area, and mostly of South Dover, Mexico, Guatemala, Peru, um, the Commonwealth, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Dominican Republic, Colombia, and Uruguay, and Nicaragua is kind of the main group of immigrants. Also, there are some minorities like you know, Costa Ricans and Brazilians. There's a population of Brazilians in, in the Northwest Branch, that's the watershed of the Anacostia River in the area of Maryland. And you know, there are some Bolivians and other groups. Uh, and this is for the district. The, the, Latino neighborhoods that you can see they are mostly in the western half of the district. Uh, and like you know, Dennis pointed out in the friend, most of the on the on the east of the river is mostly you know, African American population. And we'll see some other maps. Um, and, and you can see the, the, the education level for Latinos, at least this is for the district, uh, is very low. You can see like you know people from ninth grade to twelfth grade or less than ninth grade of a high proportion, so the you know, low education levels. Um, and also, well, the English language speaking ability, at least for the district, has improved in the last years, but it's still you know, not, not the best. And you can see like, you know, maybe like 56% of people who speak English very so. <coughs> uh, And you can see there's a lot of disparity in the income, again, for the district, but this is very representative of the Delaware and the DC area and the Anacostia watershed. Um, so you can see the different Latinos and you know, why. Uh, and then unemployment is uh, still high, you know, it's even higher for the, the African American population. So that also shows the challenges we face in each of the communities in the Anacostia watershed. They have other needs and other priorities. Demographics of the area, you can see that you know, most of the Latino people is kind of west of the river, uh, you know, the north and the west and the, the western part of the watershed. Uh, and as you can see, you know, part set in the you know, a lot of the African American population. And this is a, another interesting uh, graphic from the, the Central American integration system. This shows the rural and urban populations of uh, Central America, at least. Why Central America? Because you know, most of the immigrants here are from Central America. And you can see that even though the, the urban population is tight, that's, that's the pattern in pretty much most of the world, these are really uh, rural societies. So still, you can see in Port Honduras, a pretty high rural population. Uh, so these people has, have a really strong connection with natural resources. They are Army, uh, so that's when there's a lot of opportunities of the nation in some of the environmental work we do. <coughs> where, 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 Farming uh, and, uh, and 
actually some polls, at least on the West Coast, in California, New Mexico, have shown that they really care about the environment. And as you've seen, they, uh, in the last election, most of them are, uh, you know, they both voted blue, and you know, the Democratic Party has more pro environmental policies. So that's not the, an indicator, but uh, in general, uh, they are really pro environment. Uh, during a long cure event we had in the uh, wetland planting. We were moving basic plants uh, in March, and then we got volunteers seeding and planting natives. Um, so how have we engaged the Latino communities through our environmental education programs and volunteer events, and through our meaningful watershed education experiences, we engaged more than you know, 3,000 Last session led by AWS environmental indicators, and there's boat trips and pontoon you know, boat trips and canoe trips in the river. There's a service project which includes wetland planting, street planting, and other you know, restoration activities. And, and we have all a very uh, diverse um, group of students from different socioeconomic backgrounds, cultural backgrounds. Um, and these are some of the schools who go to Capital City. Others in, in Monterey County and Beatty County, where the, you know, the Latino population is you know, about half. And also, when we have the, the, the restoration events and the pontoon boat trips, we usually get parents and chaperones. And, and, and our environmental educator was telling me that they, they get very interested. So, one of our perhaps in the future, we're still kind of defining our overall uh, uh, strategy. But in my kind of feeling is that when parents come with the kids, it's the best time to really talk about environment. But there's, there's, you know, we need someone that speaks Spanish like me to really translate what the environmental educator is saying because the kids are bilingual and then the parents in many cases. So I think this is a great opportunity in general for us. And these are some of the events. This is the our chat program where the kids get to see the. the Chat fry uh, uh, hatching and uh, microscope with a projector, and then they release the chat fry in the river. That's a very cool program. We do it in partnership with the uh, classrooms, among other activities like the wetland planting, seed collection for meadow restoration. And all in all, we engage you know, youth and adult volunteers in our general volunteer events. Uh, as of this year, more than 6,400 volunteers. I would say like the people with a more diverse background come from college, universities, church groups, corporate employees, um, and the same for doing you know wetland restoration, trash cleanup, reforestation, etc. Some pictures from our events. You know, from uh, that that one in the center is a sorority from the University of Maryland. That's the you know, the sorority and some other groups from you know all over and. Here they're uh, planting seeds of wetland plants in Korea. It's a company. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about some aspects of just engaging Latinos, uh, you know, cultural aspects and so forth. Um, you know, like you know, Danny's Den pointed out, for, for the African American community, uh, you have to listen. Just go to them and don't wait for them to come to you. I mean, that sounds pretty logical, but in practice, They pick, you know, this is, we're talking about different cultures, so there's a different perspective on volunteering. Uh, usually for Latinos, the family is first. Usually, you know, first, first even than the community or even church in some cases. Uh, so any volunteer event has to be family related. If the kids are involved, people are going to, adults are going to participate. <coughs> You know, listen, observe, talk, and really know them. Uh, that's very important. Uh, you know, where are they from, their education level, what language they speak, is Portuguese from Brazil, or you know, Spanish, or we even have some populations of indigenous people from Guatemala, they speak Maya language as far as Spanish. Uh, names of community leaders, their issues and concerns, listen to their problems, 
and um, that really helps gauge, you know, that respect. Um, you know, also establish a presence and build trust with the community and, and just demonstrate respect for the culture and the social class. Again, this seems very logical, but uh, Latin America is a very classic society. We have kind of the famous fact of being like the, the most unequal region of the world. You know, the rich are rich as Europe or here in North America and the rest are poor as in Africa. So, and, and this is very important. <coughs> and I'm, I'm going to tell you another point why that is so important. If you're going to work with the Latino communities, work with bilingual and bicultural staff. Uh, just the fact that someone is Latino speaks Spanish uh, doesn't make that person necessarily appropriate for the job. Why is that? For those things of class that I just mentioned, some educated person from Latin America might have some attitudes for, you know, countryside people or people depending on their ethnicity. So you gotta, you know, choose the right person for that. Just the, the fact that they speak Spanish doesn't make it an appropriate person. Um, communication patterns in general are pretty direct, and that's that's kind of a culture joke. Sister, she lives in Costa Rica. This is a classical example of Latino communication. Uh, and I was asking her, when are you gonna come over here to visit us? And she was like, oh, we're gonna uh, sell our house and buy a new one. And, you know, we have a lot of these expenses. And she went on and on. So that's the indirect communication. Instead of saying, we don't have money, they come up with this story. <laughs> so that's a classical pattern of communication. You gotta understand it, you even have to have a, a person that understands it to kind of convey the message to the non-Latino. <laughs> uh, and also, especially for bad news, they will tell you what they think you want to hear rather than what they actually deliver through. So this is just a cultural you know, fact uh, uh, to consider. And then volunteering is more informal and spontaneous. They you know, think more about the present rather than the future. They are not going to be, okay, there's a uh, tree planting, we're here in you know, December, there's a tree planting in March, oh, I'm going to sign up for that, it doesn't work that way, I mean, this kind of, at the last minute, and if they are exposed to it, you know, a week before, they're going to be more likely to attend rather than, you know, planning well ahead of time, it's just, you know, a, a cultural um, feature. And a little bit on the fishing, another nice picture from Becky Carlin. Anacostia. Lisa is going to talk more about that, about this study. Uh, we surveyed the, the anglers in the river. You know, we found that 80 to 80 percent of the anglers are Latinos, and, and mostly bottom anglers. So they are catching the most dangerous species, like Brent said, catfish being the main catch. And 53 of the percent of the Spanish speakers are not aware of the health risks. Actually, I, I've been in events where I start talking with folks and. I started talking about the risk of consuming the fish, they get very interested. They have no idea. And the reason is that there's lack of fisheries uh, management and even lack of, of, of fish, uh, fish consumption advisory in the countries of origin. They just, and in some cases, they come from rural areas where the environment conditions are very good to, you know, so so. So they don't have these issues of you know, having like this nasty heavy metals and chemicals. So, you know, they were born just going to the you know, hundred yards and catching their fish without any problems or with no consumption advisories like that. And also catch and release might be, it's hard to understand, especially for subsistence anglers that comes with catch and release. Um, you know, I know that's kind of the rule for more you know, educated people, kind of a, but I, I think of it kind of as a, as a more um, kind of Western thing that, there's a lot, lots of eating and sharing with family and friends. Doing the catch and release is, is kind of a lot of people just don't get it. <clears throat> and that's also you know, kind of a cultural feature. And you know, they're also catching a lot of snakes. I've seen some Salvadorian folks uh, talking to people in the river and they have one guy last year had a big snake that's a very chub. And the, interest, and the interesting thing is that he was washing the, the fish shops ready to go home, but he was washing the fish in the Anacostia water. Uh, and I've seen also people like having a picnic and the little kids 
Indians are, are swimming in the rivers and they don't, they don't even know about the, about the, the conditions of the river. <coughs> and snakehead are kind of in a, this is an invasive species from Asia, so they're kind of in a gray area. The, the federal or the state government or district government don't give any money to analyze tissue to see the pollutant levels because it's an invasive species. It's kind of in a gray area. We don't know what's the deal with the snake is. Um, and then uh, they are very interested in the fishing. That's something that we have found in the study that uh, they, they really care about the activity of the sport, whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, so there's some ways to convey our message by knowing this fact. And some of the species that they catch here, again, the brown bullhead. Blue cats, and the thing that might make this kind of more difficult is that the DNR, the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, might change the regulations on catfish because blue cats and channel cats, the channels are not in this picture, they are invasive. They are on the Mississippi Basin, which we're introduced here. So the Maryland DNR might change the regulations, like kind of what they're doing with the snake is that you can catch, but you're not allowed to release them. You have to either eat them or you know, expose them. Might have some repercussions with our, you know, fish study and our campaign. Uh, we might be seeing an increase in people going out there and fishing. Perhaps we don't know yet, but uh, uh, it's not worth it because you know, catfish are in a very dangerous species as well as you know, carp. For the snake, it might be less of a risk. According to, I was talking to a, a, an expert the other day because they are in shallow waters and they eat fish that are mostly in the high to kind of medium levels of water columns, so they don't get exposed to all that you know, crap on the bottom, so they might be uh, less dangerous to eat than the, the bottom feeders. But we have to you know, confirm that with some tissue analysis. thousands of people 
bulletin that crossed the country, and one of the main messages that was a takeaway from those listening sessions is that people want nature close to home, and um, they don't always have that. We don't have the parks and the green space, uh, you know, within a five or ten minute walk, and that's certainly true in parts of our own city. So I did want to just highlight that, um, and also that, you know, we, this really is the century of the city. When we have um, population, urban metropolitan populations are rising, and 80 percent, actually 83 percent, point something percent of citizens now live in cities, and that number is growing across the world. So we've really got to work hard to reconcile our built environment with our natural environment. And I really believe that um, federal agencies are struggling with that and trying to figure out how to do that. I know at DOI, we are developing a new urban agenda. And our department includes agencies like the Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Park Service, the US Geological Survey, the Bureau of Land Management. So we're already working in cities across the country, but um, we can be doing better. We acknowledge that. We can certainly be working with local communities better. And one of our new initiatives um, is the Urban Waters Federal Partnership that was launched by the Environmental Protection Agency. And we're working in seven pilot sites, and the Anacostia is one of them. And the National Park Service is taking the lead on that right now. Um, so if any of you want more information about what's going on with that initiative, just come up and talk to me later. Or um, and give me your card and I'm happy to send you information. Um, let's see, okay. Let's get going here. So about uh, five years ago, um, a group of partners got together, NOAA, Fish and Wildlife Service, EPA, and local environmental groups, Riverkeeper, and Acosta Watershed Society, and it really started with NOAA and Riverkeeper, um, noting that there hadn't been any research on the Anacostia really about uh, people eating, people uh, fishing and eating fish and sharing fish. And that type of research has been done in other cities across the country. It's been done along the Hudson River. It's been done in San Francisco Bay. But there really hadn't been any look at the Anacostia, our nation's capital, which I find is often overlooked for some reason. Um, uh, so uh, a group of us got together and um, started talking about that and were able to secure some funding, it took a couple years, um, to launch a study that uh, looks at who's eating and catching fish and sharing fish in the river. And our objectives were threefold. We wanted to um, look at angular attitudes, awareness, practices, um, and we, we really wanted to get, I should have uh, perhaps split these a little bit, but we really wanted to get a sense of, oh gosh, is this really a problem? Are people eating fish from the river? Are they sharing the fish? And, and then we also, if, if that was a problem, we also wanted to say, well, how can we perhaps impact behavior um, and attitudes and, and get information out there? So one of the um, opinion works was the company we hired to do the search for us, and they're a great um, social, marketing, and behavior communications firm. Um, and what they did was they did um, interviews, focus groups, um, riverbank interviews, focus groups, um, additional inter interviews with the Latin uh, Hispanic community, and some phone and community surveys. And um, these are the so based on all of that, the results of you know, sort of what looks like the angler population is predominantly male. Um, you're talking about folks who have a lower educational attainment. Um, and it's a, 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 a large percentage is African American, Hispanic, with some um, Asians. So that, that gave us a snapshot of who the anglers are out on the Anacostia River. Um, and then we wanted to find out, well, gosh, do they, do, do these um, anglers, do they, do they know about the advisories? Are they aware of the advisories? Um, 
how are they learning about, you know, do, do they know that, you know, catfish, carcanil are pretty contaminated fish and they shouldn't be eating them? Um, and some of the questions we, we asked, so, um, some of the things that we found were that, um, first of all, they don't know a lot about the advisories, and I'll get to a slide on that, but they rely a lot on visual inspection. So let's look at the fish. Of course, as you all know, contaminants you can't see, and that's part of the problem when contaminants in a river um, don't see the pollution that is there. And um, so they really feel that in, that they, they're pretty convinced that you know just by looking at the fish, they can tell if it's clean or dirty and whether they should eat it or not. Um, so again, unseen risk. This was some of the mess one of the uh, messages that we tested. Um, you know, I think one of the responses to this um, visual that was presented in a focus group was, gosh, that fish just makes me want to grill it. And, you know, regardless of whether it's contaminated or not. Um, yeah, there it is. Um, and then one of the things we found was that there is really widespread sharing of fish in the river, which was very disconcerting. Um, a lot of people are eating the fish, um, and uh, uh, there's, they're sharing with family and friends and children and women of childbearing age. And of course, women of childbearing age and children are at most at risk from some of these contaminants that are found in the Anacostia. And I just want to make a quick note, you know, the Anacostia is not unusual. This is it's really representative of urban rivers across the United States where you have these contaminants. And you have people you know, fishing and, and eating the fish from the river. So our hope in doing this report was really to, um, to gain local attention of the problem and help try and figure out some ways to address it, but also to really hopefully spark a national discussion on you know, how are we going to address these long-term contaminants that are in our urban rivers across the country? And I, you know, that's, so anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there and just show that with you. And, you know, the other thing is, food security is a huge issue. Um, I believe the statistic is in Ward 7 and 8, maybe Dennis, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but in Ward 7 and 8, there are three grocery stores three where I live, I believe there are 18. So, um, and there are people who are hungry. I think Jorge did a great job of pointing out where the poverty um, is. And so, it, you know, all of this stuff ties together. You have contaminants, you have hunger, you have poverty. And it's really, um, it's a difficult, you know, it's very difficult. But these are some of the quotes that we got during the focus group. And you can tell, like, these, these anglers, they, they feel good about helping people as they should. If you're hungry, you got to eat something, and they've got a nice fish there, and they're going to share it. Um, so it's not an easy situation of saying, just don't eat the fish. Um, and I, I think one of the reasons why I hope we, what I hope we can discuss is, well, gosh, you know, let's think of some solutions for these, for these folks. So I, I and I just wanted to um, oops, sorry about that. I wanted to um, oh yeah there it is. The the number that our researcher came up with and it's a very conservative number of how the fish are being eaten in the community. There's about seventeen thousand people in the lower watershed that um, know that they are eating they they eat Anacostia fish. That's that's a pretty high number. That was a surprise to us. Um, at least to me, I was. I never expected to see a number like that, and that's a conservative estimate. Um, so, getting back to some of the some of the messages tested, and I don't know, some of you might be already be familiar with this, but um, there is a lot of information and research out there about risk communication and how to convey information to different audiences, and you know. It's really not rocket science. Too much copy is confusing. Um, the words you use are very critical. Um, advisory, 
uh, the anglers noted that, well, oh, gosh, I'm going to use my own judgment then, and, and I'm going to look at the fish if you're going to show with this type of language. But if you a warning, cancer, thank you, I have five minutes left, so I'm going to be quick. A warning, uh, cancer, those, those words really grabbed um, the anglers' attention and, you know, left an impact. So um, just to sum up, anglers use visual inspection. Anglers want information from trusted sources, not necessarily government, which is no surprise. Um, there's extensive sharing of the fish and eating of the fish. The hunger and food security, we have to, you know, um, we really have to figure out a way to address that. And I think there was one person in here who was from a hunger um, organization. Um, uh, we need to use very concise, direct language. Um, you know, as, as Jorge noted, um, we need to think about other languages to um, put these, this type of information is. And the final thing is the anglers are very social. I mean, it's a, it's a social thing for a lot of them to go down on the river and fish. And we can take advantage of that as a future outreach um, tool. Um, and, you know, finally, this is just the first step. This is a very small study, 111 interviews along the river bank. Um, you know, we're not, we don't have solutions. And, and this report is really intended for opinion leaders and community leaders. And what we'd like to do is really um, create a conversation around this report. Um, it's, it's, yes, it's fishing, but it's also contaminants. And how can we use this to help drive the you know, the river. Um, so we released it in November. I guess just, you know, our next steps really are, um, thanks to Anacostia Watershed Society, uh, we're going to be hosting a community meeting, um, hopefully with Congresswoman of Women Homes and Women meeting the conversation with council members, with community leaders, um, and the residents to talk about the issue and figure out, well, gosh, you know, how can we start uh, making a difference in impacting behavior and, and just uh, reducing public health risks. Uh, and um, information is on AWS's website, as is the report. Um, that's about it. So thank you very much. Baltimore's watershed. 
Um, we've got four key, four main watersheds, the Gwynn's Falls, the Jones Falls, the Herring Run, and the Baltimore Harbor, um, all running into the Patasco River and the Back River. Um, Baltimore is also a city of neighborhoods, so I'm, it was great to hear Dennis talk about the different neighborhoods in D.C. Um, we have a city of neighborhoods. There's over 200, so you can say there's 280 distinct neighborhoods in Baltimore City. And I get, I'm fortunate enough to get to work with a bunch of those community leaders. Um, and they you know, span all of the watersheds, and they have their own key things that are important to their neighborhood, and they have their own history, and it's really important, like everyone has said, to listen to what's going on with them. Um, Blue Water Baltimore emerged from four or five watershed groups, um, including the Baltimore Water Keeper and um, this individual grassroots watershed associations that um, were focused on Jones Falls, the Winds Falls, the Herring Run, and the Baltimore Harbor. We have a bunch of different programs, um, and they're all listed here. Um, the Water Keeper is our um, lawyer at the office, and she's able to hold polluters accountable, so she's really important um, to just actually, you know, say, hey, you are polluting this, this is illegal, um, take action or else. Um, public policy and legislative advocates, we had a great success passing the stormwater utility um, in the legislative, legislative session last, um, the last legislative session, so we're gonna take on some key bills this um, term as well. Water audit program is a residential program, so we do, we offer incentives to residents to better manage stormwater on their property. Blue Alleys and Neighborhoods um, is a pilot program installing pervious alleyways in some of Baltimore's um, neighborhoods on the east side. Community Greening, we plant tons of trees. We've planted about 1,800 trees so far this year. Clean Water Communities is the program that I manage, and it's a sort of participatory planning process to try to engage more community leaders in planning um, related to water quality. Green schools, we, we take out a lot of asphalt at schools and turn them into gardens, so we you know, increase access to green space there. We have a workforce development program. Um, we have a volunteer water quality monitoring program, which is the doctor's dream. And we also have a nursery to get people native plants. Um, so there's a lot going on, um, but it's all related to clean water and strong communities. Um, and all of them are related to environmental justice because we provide data, um, access to green space, and increased participation. So obviously, urban watersheds require more care because we got more people, more pavement, and more problems. And I'm going to talk about the quality of life and water quality issues um, that are sort of key and that come up a lot when listening to community leaders. And those are um, the garbage problem, um, trash is a huge problem in Baltimore, and also the, the sewage issues. Um, Trash problems. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Baltimore City. We've been recently, but there's a lot of trash in the streets, and it's a serious public health concern. Um, and also, it's obviously going into our storm drains and into our waterways. Um, but these, you can see, it's it's all over the city. So we've got right next to Penn Station, that's an overflowing trash can. We've got East Baltimore. There's a dead rat in this picture. You're just walking down the street, and this is what's going right into our storm drain. Um, this is a storm drain in my neighborhood. Um, stuff with all sorts of delicious snacks that people had and just decided to throw them on the street. Um, you can see that that communication on that storm drain is not necessarily working. Um, another storm drain. Another storm drain, and you can see that it's just sort of everywhere. Um, but it's it's pretty. There are definitely social justice issues because it's not happening in the outskirts of the city. It's happening right in the middle of the city. Um, and also dumping. There is a serious, there are serious dumping problems. That's just you know driving down the street with some community leaders, snapping a shot of you know one bag of trash turns into 50 bags of trash um, because they know someone's going to pick it up. And then this is the Gwyn's Run on the west side, so you can see how the dumping in Baltimore um, goes right into our waterways, and that's all plastic bottles. Not that we're dumped there, but you know that we're we're washed there. In um, so in addition to the trash problems, we've got pipe problems. Um, our pipes, just like DCs, are very old, um, but all of our pipes are separate. So we've got the separate stormwater and sewage pipes. Um, obviously, the sewage is, um, pipe pumps up to the sewage plant, and our stormwater just flows right into the streams. Um, and they're aging, old, and neglected, and that causes a lot of issues. Um, like this one, we just had a big sinkhole on East Monument Street, which is a gateway in Baltimore leads right to the, um, to the Hopkins School of Public Health. Um, and also there's tons of community leaders living right around here. 
Um, and that's just, I mean, that's curb to curb, hole in the street. Um, they're still facing it. It happened like back in May, I think. And one of the community leaders I work with closely was saying how a lot of his neighbors are, their walls are cracking from all the jackhammers and all of the, you know, repairs that need to happen over a prolonged period of time. So you can see just how, you know, this was a storm drain that collapsed. Now there's no street there. Um, and so those are the things that really call people to action. Um, and it was interesting, actually, a, a kid that I was working with was telling me when, we, when I showed him that this diagram that we use as an educational tool, I was like, does this look like anyone's neighborhood? Just to talk about in general. He was like, that looks like Monument Street, because there's a hole in the street. <laughs> Just to show you like what it looks like under the street, but it's, it's funny how like, you know, kids can use it. Um, obviously, the problem of quantity, um, the quantity of water when it hits our pavement, our paved surfaces, there's too much of it. Um, and it puts a lot of pressure on those pipes and our sewage pipes to go along our stream beds to take advantage of gravity. And then you have things like sewage fills like this, and again, we saw some of these pictures earlier. Um, but you can see just, I mean, the Herring Run, this is right down the street from my office, and it's constantly contaminated with sewage. Um, and we have also communication problems about that. I mean, we can't contact the water in Baltimore. Our urban streams are very polluted with sewage, I and mean, that can cause staph infections. If it gets on your skin, you have a cut. Um, but we have maybe one sign in a whole stream, and so no one really knows. You see people playing in the water. Um, so there's a, a communication uh, issues, and also this is kind of a lot of information, like um, like you were talking about with like how do you do the signage? It, it's a difficult thing, and, and it can be hard to communicate between the person that's making the sign and the person that's supposed to be reading the sign. Um, so we use a lot of different tools to try to improve the health of Baltimore's waterways as well as Baltimore's neighborhoods. You can see some of them here, tree plantings, and I'm just going to highlight a few of them. I want to leave time for discussion, so that's why I'm hurrying. Um, tools to increase accountability. Again, we have the water keeper. She's a lawyer. She can sue, um, and you know, she they do a lot of monitoring. Um, we have biweekly monitoring, um, and on the middle branch and the inner harbor. Um, so the Baltimore Harbor water keeper works by monitoring, enforcing the law, and advocating. Um, we also have a volunteer uh, monitoring program, so that gives people access to their streams and starts to like, and some people don't even know there's a stream right down the street. Um, so it helps them kind of realize, okay, what's going on in here? Um, tools to increase communication. Um, again, I work on the Clean Water Community Initiative, and it's a partnership between all of these organizations listed at the bottom here. Um, the Healthy Harbor Initiative, the Baltimore Community Foundation, Baltimore City Department of Public Works, key partner. Um, Blue Water Baltimore Parks and People, and Clean and Greener Baltimore, which is shifting into the new phase. But this is a meeting here. We have the Bureau Head of Solid Waste standing up there, Val Valley Cuomo, and a community leader, Betty Glenn Thomas, who lives in Charlotte <coughs> Hall. And the point is to, to facilitate dialogue, to increase the you know conversations that are happening between the people that are governing and the people who are being governed. You know, the city and the citizens, and also the nonprofits that are working to try to improve those. Um, so. Again, with the Clean Water Community Initiative, um, we do participatory planning, so it's a lot of the listening. What's going on already in a neighborhood? Schools, like associations, existing momentum, what assets do we have already? And how can we build on those to do clean and green projects, education and awareness, and advocacy? So um, just like everyone's been saying, listening is really key and then you know, providing a way that people can take action. Um, also, we've been doing a lot of storm drain arts, People don't know what the storm drains are. They don't um, realize that they're not a place to put garbage. Uh, so we need to do some education about the storm drains. And we found that engaging kids in the arts um, on the storm drains is a really great way to do that. Um, this guy came up with, his name was Emmanuel, and he came up with this, littering makes me crabby, so clever. And then we put it on the storm drain um, and all painted it together with, us, with their parents. It's a great way to get people engaged um, of all ages. People are really excited about painting the street. Um, so, and then again, other tools to increase participation, um, greening, getting people to plant trees, kids love worms, they're like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Um, and then cleaning, we have a cleanup, and this is right next to our incinerator, um, so it's very visually very interesting to, to take people there, um, but you know, obviously it would be great if we didn't have to do the cleanup in the water, do it up in the neighborhood first. Um, so again, thank you. I was kind of rushing because I wanted to be sure that we can all, all talk today. Um, this is a block party in my neighborhood, and we're making um, seed balls. 
and you know that's a great way also to get you know get his, his hands in the dirt. Um, but again, you know, I'm so thankful that I could be here today, and I'm happy to answer any more questions um, in just a few moments. So thank you. Thanks. So um, we're going to move into the Q and A now, and you know, I always. It's always frustrating when you go to a conference and the session runs long. So uh, I did that with this session. I'm sorry. Um, I think we're supposed to be out of here at 11:30. But Dr. Wilson had the foresight of not scheduling uh, lunch until noon. So I think I'm going to invite our panelists up here to sit at the table. And then if you have any questions uh, you want to ask, uh, I will. Since uh, we are the ones that spoke long, I'll commit us to uh, staying long enough to answer all your questions. So. impacts, you know, a wide segment of the community. 
so um, you know those are things that um, you know we constantly uh, engage uh, uh, the community around and then one other thing is uh, we have more green space uh, uh, in that area uh, east of the Anacostia River than any other part of the city outside of the National Mall and a lot of this green space is unmanaged um, you know um, um, poorly kept in some aspect and as a result um, you know they're uh, not accessed and not utilized by the uh, local community so I even put safety uh, in in that area of, uh, of, a, of a disparity and uh, when we talk about environmental uh, justice or environmental injustice uh, accessibility to uh, you know an abundant amount of green space for a community you know really impacts their uh, overall uh, health as well. Yeah so just quickly things that have really resonated um, with community leaders that I've talked to over the past um, two years and just before that I know um, the trash issue people are really engaged in the trash issue on a really local level um, we have a we, this year we had a clean community competition that was run by the city and there were over 70 community associations that signed themselves up which shows that like there's these community associations that are saying we're going to win this competition um, and it was all over in all different neighborhoods different types of neighborhoods in Baltimore um, and people you know fought really hard to win this competition what makes a clean community that's a great question but you know some of it was the amount of trash picked up storm drains stenciled um, vacant lots that were adopted and revitalized um, so there's definitely um, each year we have two cleanups outside of the competition and um, that's run by the city and community leaders really get into those like there'll be like 90 associations that sign up so I kind of see that as an indicator of you know people getting mobilized and engaged um, so definitely trash is a huge issue and um, you know some of the ladies that I work with are in their 70s and they've been doing this since they were kids um, so it's it's not changing and it's something that, that people are really you know trying um, as well as um, yeah, I'd say, I'd say the trash issue is, is, the, is the one that really gets with people the most. Um, and also anything that can engage you. People, you know, our rec centers are closing in Baltimore, so anything that you can get, you know, kids engaged in um, is really something that mobilizes the neighborhood. Yeah, I, um, about the Angler study, I thought that's a kind of degree study. Um, but I'm interested in knowing what the, how if you could measure, go to the next step and see how the implications for public health are, how many more people, what are the risks that are associated with the, 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 the how bad is that, and how many people, do you, how many, how does it show up in the healthcare system? I mean, are there more cases of cancer or childhood diseases or something that, that you could, is, is, is there some sort of link that you can make to that? Yeah, so, um, on our advisory team um, that was with the help of the EPA and their risk assessors to, risk, um, to, to look at those actual questions of risks um, and how bad it is. Um, but one thing I wanted to point out was um, a, a study done for New York City for Hudson River anglers um, where they actually um, collected lab work Actually, that was 
uh, Dr. Wilson came out for that panel because he and I had met at another event. I asked him to come out and speak at that. And so when he went to do his literature search to, to speak about that, he said, there's a, there's information about exposure from you know swimming and stuff like that, but there hasn't been research done anywhere on the uh, health risks faced by you know boaters and their levels of water contact, kayakers and their levels of water contact. So when it comes to something, there was a combined sewage discharge because it rained really hard yesterday. How many days should you wait before going out on the river? That question can't be answered right now. And that was kind of mind-boggling. So we've already been working on some of that kind of stuff uh, with Dr. Wilson. And so now with the fish study, we're trying to pursue that a little bit further. He's going to do some tissue research through some uh, grant sources that he has. So that's um, some things we're looking at. But in the bigger picture, you know, it's really hard to pin these things down because the River Terrace community, which Dennis mentioned, right across the street from the Pepco power plant, uh, through a lot of amazing community organizing uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago, they got a study done by the uh, Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. And if I could summarize a long report in one sentence, it would be that there's so much environmental injustice in that community that they couldn't pin it on any one cause. Because that neighborhood is bounded by the Pepco Power Plant, the Anacostia River, 295, and East Capitol Street. So they're completely hemmed in by roads, power plants, and a polluted river. So basically it was like, meh, who knows? Uh, you know, which is, the scientists don't shoot me, but you know, that's the way I, I talk about it as an advocate. But it seems like you wanted to pitch it on this. about the uh, railroad, uh, CSX railroad tracks oh, yeah, all right. over the border that neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah, there's actually a good study that just came out of Chicago yeah. on the kayaking issue, but it's it's not on toxins. It's all on the kind of sewage, you know, linking it to pathogen exposures. Um, but that's a that's a big step forward in that literature about recreational water exposures in kind of the, the GI illness area. Um, but my question is, you know, what uh, what's the goal? Is is the goal to kind of get a large initiative started at the mayor mayor level or? Like in Baltimore, there's this fishing and swimming in the harbor by 2020. Like, what's the progress on that? And is that the vision in DC in terms of the Anacostia? Because unless you have some big leadership vision with, I mean, the 2020 initiative, from my understanding, you know, involves pushes from the private sector and kind of the, um, the more wealthy sections of Baltimore in addition to the kind of the grassroots. So, you know, what's the vision or the goal DC in terms of a, a, a higher So officially, level. DC, uh, the Department of the Environment, has a goal of official swimmable river by 2032. So that's what's officially on the books. That's what they think is realistic. But again, keep in mind that watershed map. So DC could green infrastructure every acre of land in their section of the watershed. And if Prince George's and Montgomery County aren't doing what they need to be doing, it's not really going to matter. So we need a regional solution for this. And there is a regional partnership. Um, that all of the organizations and the state and federal partners participate in um, that's you know moving some of these things forward. So, uh, but it's uh, complicated. So. What congregation is the that's centered in Someone here today that I would recommend that you meet. Uh, her name is Dottie Younger, and she's um, uh, heads of a group called the Chesapeake uh, Covenant Community, and uh, and they have they they're engaged with each of us, uh, Anacostia Watershed, and others, and they they they're a good place for a faith um, uh, based organization to uh, connect in with and find out a number of things, number of ways that you can uh, um, you know, get involved. So I would recommend. Um, did you meet her today? She is here. Yeah, she's on another panel right now. If I can just address that for a minute, I think one of the biggest challenges that DC faces is that we do not have a vote on the council. We don't have any, we don't have that approach. And that kind of Yeah, so 
what it's for and just so I don't know. Oh, sorry. I know it's fun, not a big deal. Um, okay, so the utility was just passed in Maryland and that is a um, pretty much a fee charged to each property, um, residential and um, private. Um, and it's a it's, it's again it's based on impervious cover um, at your home or at your business. Um, so it's just like your water bill, but now you pay for the amount of impervious area at your home. Um, so, and then they have a credit system. They're all, they're working this out. It just passed, so they don't have to have the credit system and the fee, well, they have the fee structure figured out, but they don't have to have it all figured out by um, June of 2013. So they're working it out now, but you'll get credits for participating in cleanups, or you'll get credit for installing a rain garden at your home that manages the storm water coming off your rooftop. Um, so there, you can see how that's a little bit confusing, and so the credit system is, we're currently in the stakeholder process um, of figuring out that credit system. Um, but we worked a lot with um, Anacostia Watershed Society and um, Julie Lawson from uh, Trash Free Maryland to try to, to, to work to get that bill passed. Um, so, and, and this year we'll be trying to take on the, the bag bill. And, and that also is, is in place here in D.C. Yeah, D.C. has it. Yeah, D.C. is uh, state, statewide, not just. Well, so technically the bill applies to jurisdictions that have phase one MS4 permits, but it applies to Montgomery and Prince George's County as well, so I know Prince George's County is working with their system as well. So. Okay. It's, it's the anacostiaws.org slash fishing. You can download it there. And I think if you just go to our homepage, there's like a, it's in the quick links box on the homepage. Do you have any Yeah. <laughs> Um, I ask a lot of people why they litter, um, and now we're trying to do it in a more structured way. So we, we've gotten some grants to do, you know, trash behavior change research. Um, you know, the overwhelming answer is because they don't care. Um, so how do you kind of break that down and figure out how to, you know, what you can do to help um, behavior change? Um, but there isn't really a citywide effort to reduce litter. Um, it's starting. You know, we've had them historically, um, but it's. There's enough of a ground toll right now. People are really, really angry and can't believe that we haven't figured out, you know, just basic city services, waste management. So um, stay tuned for, you know, the most effective litter campaign you've ever seen. Um, no, we're, we're, we're trying and people are really, really care about it. And there's a lot of, you know, different initiatives that have been sparking up. Um, so, and, and we're trying to, you know, measure that and do these sort of before and after surveys, working with schools to see what the kids know before see what they know after, and also see what the school grounds look like before and after. There was, there was a huge, and I think it's still ongoing, um, DC trash initiative led by the Alice Ferguson Foundation. Are you familiar with that? I am. I think it's like, I don't know what you did before, but if I were to do it, you know, you're talking about the first email from the um, um, signs on the boss box saying,
one of the things that was really interesting to me about that research was they found that a lot of people that litter actually consider themselves to be clean, but what they define as their personal space is incredibly small. So they want their front seat of their car to be clean so their McDonald's cup out the window. Or, you know, their property is clean, but this, you know, the sidewalk in front of their house is someone else's problem. Um, so it's really sort of an interesting issue. And some of it's, I think, a reaction to the environment they find themselves in, and some of it is sort of, you know, limiting the scope of your personal responsibility. Um, you, know, we, you know, we spend all, every day worrying about all the things we have to worry about we go crazy. So. But the, one of the messages that worked was children and the impact of children, and I think they had a small child holding up a cigarette butt in the playground. You know, and that that impact that really influenced those crashers to change behavior. That's good. Okay, John, for all panelists. So, uh, what would be the private uh, role, private industry developer, developer, problem that friendly way? So that the services that we came from the river uh, uh, be, you know, you know, be accessible to the general population. The general population would really be carrying the environment, uh, the whole, you know, watershed, if they are getting a direct service from it. Otherwise, it's going to be quick. Never seen it in their life or, you know, driving on board. So, what would be the target, you know, development? You know, between the government and the private and solving this work as well. Opening up this you know, place for investment. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, and I'll, I'll speak on that because I, I, you know, I, I, I was saying that I don't think that there's a separation between any of the efforts, and an economy is one of those that has that plays a big part in it all. Um, uh, our our waterways, uh, especially, in, I, you know, I focus a lot on Anacostia in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's a natural resource that is also, I, I consider, a potential economic engine. Um, and inaccessibility to uh, the residents, the people who not only live in, you know, uh, in proximity to the river, but also uh, visitors to the city. Washington, D.C. is one of the top tourist areas of the world. And um, if, you know, if the activities that can take place on the river uh, are not accessible to those tourists or to those residents, then that's a lot of dollars uh, that could go to a number of things that are just, you know, like uh, not happening. Uh, I took a group of young people uh, to an area in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, uh, to uh, do a whitewater rafting activity and in the uh, uh, Potomac uh, uh, in that area. And one of the young men, very astutely, uh, at the end of the activity, uh, because we were telling him, yeah, you know, this is a great activity, it's in the river, they, they had a good time. And he looked, he came back and he looked, he, he asked, uh, he said, wow, you know, he was looking at all of the tubing, all of the kayaking, how many canoes were in there. He, he looked at all of that and he said, Mr. Chestnut, he said, um, how much are each one of those, um, how much does it cost each one of those canoes and kayaks? How much do they charge to have those in there? Because he looked around and he said, man, if we did this on Anacostia, we could really make some bank. So, um, I mean, astutely, he was correct. You know, that, that like, I mean, it was buzzing with activity. And this was way up in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. We are right in the middle of a metropolitan municipal area, and folks are staying away from the river. So um, economically, private industry can be one of those that, you know, we need everyone on board. Um, the government, federal, municipal, they get our tax dollars and, 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 and utilize those in, in the ways that they do. But uh, we need the private uh, industry uh, to get on board and be a part of the team that actually invests in uh, making these natural resources something that can benefit everyone. They'll make money off of it.
And so just <coughs> really quick to jump on that. So one of the things that I've seen really make a difference in the last few years is down around the Navy Yard and Ballpark area, the Capitol Riverfront Business Improvement District, there's been an incredible amount of private investment down there, and it's just the tip of the iceberg for the money that's gonna be spent down there. And their, the vision that group has is selling the waterfront. So in between, you know, right next to the pump house, the ECC pump house, in between the National Ballpark and the river, there used to be a concrete plant that's been removed. It's a bare piece of ground. And if you look at the renderings for the development that's gonna go in there, the front door of that development is the Anacostia River. They've got docks, they have people kayaking in the renderings. So I mean, that makes a tremendous amount of difference. You know, um, Foundry Lofts just up the road uh, in the Navy Yard area, the Yards Park. I mean, people are buying real estate with views of the Anacostia River for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I think it's fair to say that five years ago, if you would have said that, people would have locked you up in the blue. So it makes a tremendous amount of difference because you know we're never gonna be a pristine environment. So you have to recognize what's the best urban environment you can have. And I think that there's a vision for that, but in Baltimore, it's actually even bigger because the Waterfront Partnership is a lot, and they are, have a lot of money and interest driving that 2020 goal. And they're the business district around the waterfront and they realize that it's hurting their bottom line to sell a dirty waterfront. So they've even doubled down on what's happening in a small part of the Anacostia waterfront. So, you know, private funds spent the right way, it makes a tremendous difference. I think actually what you just said said was very well into the question I wanted to have, which is how issues of gentrification and mixed income communities play into this. Um, you mentioned, and I know I live in, D, I live in DC, so down by the waterfront near the Nationals Park, like hundreds of thousands of dollars condos. I'm interested though because I feel like there's some hesitation in lower income communities about improving environments and doing things like that exactly because they've seen other neighborhoods in DC once they're cleaned up, once they're improved, everything gets too expensive and people get pushed out of their home neighborhoods. I'm curious to know if you've encountered any of that in your work and how you lay concerns and how we, do we balance that because making an area nicer, improving the environmental condition of an area makes it more valuable and more expensive. How do we balance those concerns? Yeah, so real quick, I know other people are going to want to respond to this. Real quick, this is something we've totally seen um, at toxic sites that we've talked about cleaning up, like Washington Gas, where the boathouses are, uh, many of them predominantly African American, and the Pepco site and the neighborhoods that border around there. Uh, you know, people will say as soon as they clean this up, the gentrification is going to come, and then we're out. And I just think that um, what we've done over the years as an organization is be in the community and try to establish a level of trust that says we want, and, and say my message is always, we want to clean this up for you. You have suffered the burden of this for a long time. River Terrace should be the coolest neighborhood in D.C. It borders the river. they got a metro stop right there. They've got all kinds of great stuff going on. They're really the only people that live right on the river. But because of these differential burdens, they haven't had the enjoyment of that location that they should have had all this time. And, uh, and I'll tell you what, is I've been to public meetings all over the city, all over the watershed, and I've never once had somebody look at me cross-eyed. Because I think that if you go in there and you're genuine about Know, what your message is, I think people understand that. But I'd love to hear what other people on the panel have to say. Yeah, uh, one of the things, I'll contribute to that briefly. And, and you're exactly right. Uh, this is one of the things that uh, 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 we've confronted, um, you know, on, on a, on, you know, quite a bit. I mean, every, every uh, even including something as small as putting a, um, uh, developing a vacant lot in the neighborhood, uh, into a pocket park or a community garden or something along this line. Uh, even though it was, it was trash strewn, uh, overgrown, uh, people were very, some of the local people within the community were very reluctant to see it uh, take this kind of transformation on because of that fear of it leading to them being, um, you know, some kind of way um, pushed out, forced out. Um, one of the ways that, that and I, I stated earlier, one of the ways that we approach that is by uh, building trust with the community um, uh, is very important. And that's why getting in and listening and engaging with uh, the uh, community uh, helps to build that trust. But also, uh, I personally feel that one of the ways of uh, combating uh, gentrification, and, and I'm on another panel later this, this afternoon, I'm gonna really address this, 
And this whole discussion around uh, green jobs is really uh, something that's being talked about a lot. And um, the, these, one of the ways of combating gentrification is for those who live in those communities being able to stay in those communities as that change begins to take place and being a part of that change. And the economics of it is a big part of it because uh, what's going to uh, take care of taxes is being able to pay them. And you can't do that being unemployed. So uh, we have uh, issues of uh, people uh, needing training and being skilled up, take on some of the kinds of jobs that will be a part of this. So all of that is all kind of inter in, in one, intertwined in it. But you're absolutely right. This is a fear on the part of a large uh, segment of community. And another thing is a lot of the people who are coming in, who these communities see coming in and engaging in the work uh, are not people who are from within that community and who don't look like them. And it's just a, it, it builds a fear of, of, you know, just what you're speaking of, that they're going to be pushed out.